Okay, welcome everyone to this week's webinar talk sponsored by the Chicago DOE Alliance Center. This week we're pleased that Valeri Levitas will be giving the presentation. Valeri is a distinguished professor in engineering with appointments in three different engineering departments at Iowa State. He's also a faculty scientist at Ames Laboratory. Valeri moved to Iowa State in Ames in 2008. And prior to that, he was at Texas Tech, University of Hanover, and at the Institute for Superhard Materials in Kiev, which at the time was a world leading institute in that field and where he received his PhD. Valeri is an expert in plastic deformation of materials, particularly at very high pressures and uses both theory and experiments to address a wide range of problems with a principal focus on the coupling of plastic deformation and phase transformations, which I believe he'll tell us about today. And he does these experimentally with rotational diamond anvil cells and different kinds of simulations. So welcome, Valeri, and I'll turn this over to you. Thank you very much, Russ, for invitation and for Introduction, thank you everyone for joining us. Title of my talk is Plastic Strain Induced Phase Transformations Under High Pressure for Scale Theory in Situ Experiments and Phenomena. And I would like to acknowledge all my collaborators, uh, students, former students, postdocs, and current funding. Well, uh, I will start. Why it does not? Okay. I will start with insulting your intelligence and giving some simple definitions. So this is a schematic stress strain curve. Uh, if you are moving along this line, loading, unloading, and there is no residual strain, this is elastic deformation. If you go further and after unloading, we receive residual strain, this is plastic strain, we have hysteresis, this is essence of plasticity phenomena. And all metal forming processes are based on plasticity phenomena. And uh, main mechanism is related to the nucleation and motion of dislocations. Here you see dislocation pile up against grain boundary. And I will talk about this uh, uh, in detail. And also twinning, grain boundary sliding, and some others. Okay, now I will define phase transformation, displacive phase transformation as deformation of crystal lattice of low pressure phase or so austenite in uh, crystal lattice of high pressure phase or so martensite, which is described by transformation strain tensor. In given case, this is cubic to tetragonal, and because of symmetry of cubic phase, we have three different crystallographically equivalent variants of high pressure phase. And uh, this is a schematic of all six components of stress tensor. And when they work along, produce work along uh, the transformation strain, this is main mechanical part of driving force. It's not just pressure volumetric strain, it's a product of all components of stress tensor um, uh, on uh, corresponding component of transformation strain tensor. And this is energy. Gibbs energy, uh, this minimum corresponds to low pressure phase, these two to variants of high pressure phases. When minima are equal, then uh, phases are in equilibrium. Then when we are increased stresses, minimum for high pressure phase reduces, but there is barrier. And if uh, this is low temperature and we neglect thermal fluctuation, nothing happens. So we need to further increase stresses and reduce minimum until this barrier disappears. And when this barrier disappears, um, low pressure phase loses its stability and transforms to high pressure phase. And this is barrierless transformation. And we will discuss this is a criterion for barrierless uh, transformation. It's the same as phase transformation criterion for ideal material. 
So this is uh, someone probably will give completely different definition of phase transformation, but this uh, works out a purpose and you know how firefighter distinguished between piano and violin. Uh, piano burns longer, so and this is sufficient. Well, I will discuss first uh, experimental results in uh, rotational diamond anvil cell, and then we'll discuss four scale theory which we developed for understanding and interpretation and prediction of uh, various phenomena under such conditions. At atomistic scale, our main goal is to determine lattice instability conditions. We just discussed them. This is the same as phase transformation criteria for ideal crystal, defect-free crystal. And we use molecular dynamics and density functional theory, also determine stress strain curves, elastic properties, and so on. At nanoscale, uh, we study interaction between phase transformation and discrete dislocations. We using analytical method, molecular dynamic, but mostly we develop new phase field approach, which is very powerful for these purposes. At uh, micro scale, we develop completely different phase field approach, scale free phase field approach, uh, which allows us to treat much larger sample. And also we use micromechanics to derive um, kinetic equation for plastic strain induced phase transformation. And this kinetic equation is part of our uh, micro scale, macro scale model, which we use to model behavior of sample under, of sample under compression traditional diamond cell or under compression and torsion in rotational diamond in the cell. Okay, so each high pressure lab has a, a diamond anvil cell. You see that sample within gasket or without gasket is compressed by two anvils, that is all everyone does. And uh, using modern in-situ techniques, one can study phase transformation and various processes in sample. What we are doing differently, after compression, we fixed force and superpose rotation of one anvil with respect to another. And this superposes large plastic shear, which actually changes everything. And this is similar to high pressure torsion. This is technological process. Um, but what I want to say is that uh, actually all what I will tell plastic strain induced phase transition, uh, you, everyone also observes in traditional diamond cell under compression without transmitting media. So the same physics, kinetics, and we will discuss this. And even under hydrostatic conditions, after phase transition starts, there is large transformation strain, which causes huge internal stresses and plastic deformation. And again, interaction between phase transformation and plasticity is very important even under hydrostatic conditions. So what we measure? We use in situ synchrotron radiation um, to measure uh, X-ray diffraction pattern based on them and here based on equation of state, we uh, measure distribution of um, uh, radial distribution along sample radius of uh, pressure within each phase in given case, yeah, and it's uh, uh, average over the sample thickness, but in each phase separately. This is example for phase transition for hexagonal to super hot versitic boron nitride. And uh, it's uh, very important to measure them separately because uh, uh, phase transition occurs in low pressure phase. So we need pressure in low pressure phase. And you see difference here, six GPA or by factor of two. Also, we measure distribution of uh, volume fraction of phases at diff uh, uh, different uh, loading conditions, distribution of texture, distribution of different types of defects. In given case for um, layer, it's the graphite-like structure. This is concentration of turbostratic stacking fold, but it can be dislocation density. And uh, using X-ray absorption, we measure uh, thickness and uh, profile of sample. Uh, well, there are various phenomena. Uh, caused by plastic shear, but I will focus on two of them. Uh, first, plastic shear 
plastic straining significantly reduces phase transformation pressure. For example, in this experiment, um, hexagonal boronitride, highly disordered, was transformed to versitic boronitride at 6.7 GPA and rotation of 300 degrees. But under hydrostatic conditions, such phase transition doesn't occur even at uh, 53 GPA. Similar rhombohedral, irreversible rhombohedral, uh, boronitride to cubic boronitride. It's 5.6 versus 55. So you see order of magnitude reduction in transformation pressure, and I will show even stronger reduction. Second, plastic shear leads to new phases, which vented and probably could not be obtained under hydrostatic conditions. And here is example of high density, new high density amorphous phase of silicon carbide, which was obtained at 30 GPA and large plastic shear. And under quasi high GPA. Very recently, we found a new disordered super hot phase of boronitride. We detected it using X ray and Raman uh, scattering, and you see it uh, cracks diamond. And even cubic boronitride does not crack diamond. Well, uh, main theoretical problem is that uh, none of this phenomena can be explained uh, within um, classical macroscopic thermodynamics, even if you substitute pressure and volumetric strain with uh, stress tensor and uh, uh, transformation strain tensor. So this is simple illustration. Here is mechanical part of thermodynamic driving phosphor phase transition. Pressure multiplied by volumetric strain plus shear, stress multiplied by transformation shear. Problem is that uh, shear stress is limited by yield strength and shear, which let's say one GPA. So if you apply 50 GPA pressure and uh, let's assume such kinematic hypothesis, then you see that contribution of shear stress to driving force is just 2%. If you change here something, uh, uh, in good direction, we can get here 10%, maybe 20%, but there is no way to explain uh, reduction in pressure by factor of 2 to 10 and more. So that is why we develop completely different theory. Actually, it's four scale theory. Each scale describes corresponding features. And um, at atomistic scale, our main, uh, main uh, goal was to find phase transformation criteria. This is the same as lattice instability criteria, which I mentioned, and the action of all six components of stress tensor. This uh, sounds like an unsolvable problem because uh, there are a huge number of combinations of all six components of stress tensor, but we also we are also developing phase field approach. And within phase field approach, we derived analytically expression for phase transformation criteria. So now we don't need to, we need just to check it. Uh, we don't need to exhaust all possible combination. And this is doable and much simpler. So let's consider first loading. This is example for silicon one to silicon two. It's cubic to tetragonal uh, geometrically. And let's consider loading uh, with three normal stresses, normal to phase cubic phases. And uh, this is our analytical phase transformation criterion. Sigmas are stresses, and some combination of stresses should exceed some threshold. Key point that this combination is linear in stresses. So in space sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, it describes plane. Below this plane, nothing happens. And uh, when we reach this plane, a barrierless phase transition occurs. Then, Let's rotate this plane until it, uh, it sees as a, as a line. And then green dots here are results of MD simulation, and dots here are results of DFT simulation. And you see that both are in very good agreement with our prediction. And uh, from fitting, we can find two unknown material parameters in this criteria. So then we apply all six 
components of stress tensor. We add three uh, shear stresses. Criterion is look more sophisticated, but in this additional uh, term, there are no new material parameters. And also both MD and DFT show the deviation from our analytical prediction is within 5%. So now we have simple analytical expression for phase transformation criterion in ideal material on the action of all six components of stress tensor and with just two material parameters, which we calibrated. So this is, um, now we can uh, predict phase transition at any combination of stress, um, of components of stress tensor. And this is well beyond from what was done in literature. Uh, mostly maximum it was two components, two different uh, com components of stress tensor. Okay, and to also, DFT gives us stress strain curves at different loading conditions. Instability corresponds to maximum stress here. And uh, also we found fifth degree approximation for uh, elastic energy. That means uh, elastic constants up to fifth degree. And uh, you see here that uh, our analytical stress strain curves, which comes from this energy, is uh, in uh, good correspondence with experiment with uh, DFT simulation, including instability points and for strains uh, up to 35 uh, up to 35 percent. And previously, only sort of the elastic constants were known, and uh, it was they were calibrated uh, uh, for strains below three percent. Okay, and I will mention only one result, that uh, under hydrostatic conditions, this phase transition from DFT and from MD occurs at 60, 76 GPA. Under uniaxial loading, it's just 11 GPA. So mean pressure is three times smaller, it's 3.7 GPA. That means uh, it's 20 times smaller than under hydrostatic conditions. So extremely strong effect of non-hydrostatic stresses. But problem is that we cannot apply uniaxial 11 GPA to real defective material because yield strength is much lower. So how then we can use uh, this knowledge? Well, we use it by uh, introducing defects and uh, you will see now. Now we switch to uh, nanoscale, um, to nanoscale model and um, well, uh, one of uh, points which was not recognized by high pressure community and by severe plastic, but severe plastic deformation community, that there are two completely different types of phase transformation. It's pressure induced phase transformation and plastic strain induced phase transformation under hydrostatic conditions. So all of phase transformation in real material starts at defects. Why? Because uh, defects produce stress concentrator. For example, if you consider dislocation pile up, a tip of dislocation pile up, all components of stress tensors uh, are, well, are proportional to number of dislocations. So we may have quite large st high stresses here. And pressure-induced phase transformation starts and occur, occur at pre-existing defects. So for example, um, uh, we apply 10 GPA uh, phase, in the phase transformation pressure for perfect material is 15 GPA and let uh, dislocation pile up consisting of five dislocation produce uh, five uh, GPA. So that means that uh, in this region, in this region, uh, pressure reaches 15 GPA and nucleation starts. But then pressure should be increased uh, to activate nucleation at uh, four dislocations by love. Well, let's say uh, pressure, uh, pressure concentration is four GPA. So we need to reach uh, 11 GPA and so on. Then we need to increase to uh, 12 GPA and uh, so you see that for pressure induced phase transition, number of defects is limited, and that is why pressure has to be increased. And uh, in contrast, for plastic uh, strain induced nucleation, for plastic strain induced phase transition, 
uh, occurs at new defects which are permanently generated during plastic flow. And that is why we can keep pressure constant and um, increase plastic deformation and inject new defects and uh, produce new dislocation pileups and uh, new nuclei at tip of dislocation pileup. So pressure should not grow. But most important is that uh, plastic strain induced dislocation pileup may have much more dislocation. It can be 10, it can be 100. I showed in second slide uh, uh, approximately 20 dislocation in the pileup. So all components of stress tensor can be very high here. And that is why one need much lower pressure than for pressure induced phase transformations. Also, what is important is that uh, nucleation occurs in small nano volume. And uh, it's uh, very probable that it's defect free. And that is why <coughs> shear stresses, so deviatoric stresses, non hydrostatic stresses, are limited here by theoretical strengths, which is one to two orders of magnitude larger than, than macroscopic yield strengths. So actually, shear stresses can be here 10 GPA, 20 GPA, and now they produce very large uh, contribution, especially as we reduce external pressure. And uh, finally, because uh, such unique stress state with very high non-hydrostatic stresses cannot be reached in the bulk, because in bulk they are limited by the microscopic yield strengths, then uh, there, are, there are chances that such stress state will uh, uh, lead to new phases which uh, cannot be accessed under hydrostatic conditions. So this is uh, main idea. Initially, I develop a um, simple analytical model which uh, described quite well uh, many experimental results, but with a lot of uh, hand waving. And now we are doing this much stricter. And uh, this is um, we develop phase field approach for these purposes. First, um, <clears throat> for phase transformation, then for dislocation, then for the interaction. It uh, took uh, almost 20 years. And uh, now we can study this, uh, well, directly by solving differential equation. So let's consider model material with phase equilibrium pressure of 10 GPA, uh, phase instability pressure for perfect material is 20 GPA, and then we, for such material, we introduce one dislocation loaded hydrostatically and phase transition occurs at 16 GPA. So now let's consider by crystal under the compression and shear. You see here the dislocation nucleated grain boundary and pile up against grain boundary and uh, produce here strong stress concentrator. And uh, here these stresses due to tip of dislocation pileup, fulfill our uh, lattice instability or phase transformation criterion, which we obtain um, with atomistic simulation and used in our uh, phase field model. So here, barrierless nucleation occurs. And if you consider pressure average over this grain, it's just 1.2 GPA. So you see it's indeed um, more than order of magnitude below phase transition pressure under hydrostatic condition, and almost order of magnitude lower than phase equilibrium pressure, even phase equilibrium pressure. So it's deeply in the region of stability of low pressure phase. And uh, if you increase, increase shear, you see that there is growth, curless sense, and quite large <coughs> red region is high pressure phase, uh, quite large uh, region transforms into high pressure phase, but here we neglect the dislocations in the right grain. If you introduce dislocation, you see that the transformed region is quite, it's much smaller. So it's not uh, straightforward. Plasticity always plays dual role. It promotes phase transition by creating stress concentrator, but it also relaxes these uh, stresses and uh, uh, compete with phase transition. But we can find such combination of shear stresses and pressure that you see here results without plasticity in the right grain and with plasticity in the right grain, you see dislocations here, practically the same. So it's controllable. 
And now I want to summarize this uh, uh, result as new possible routes for defect-induced material synthesis under high pressure. So instead of increasing external pressure, one can su successively fill material with strain-induced defects like dislocation pileup, and they cause strong stress concentrator of all components of stress tensor. And um, because of large number of dislocations, it can be very high. And uh, also deviatoric stresses are limited by theoretical strength, which is one to two orders of magnitude, larger than the macroscopic strain. And um, first, this allows us to reduce external pressure to reach lattice instability. And also because of uh, very high uh, non-hydrostatic stresses, which are not reachable in bulk, this may lead to an access to new phases and accessible on the hydrostatic and quasi-hydrostatic conditions. So this is um, uh, main results from phase field. We have also some confirmation from uh, molecular dynamics here. There is dislocation pile up. It's not shown. It's quite long here against uh, uh, three different grain boundaries in silicon and uh, uh, 60 degree shuffle dislocations. And for all grain boundaries, we obtain that uh, uh, the same curve, uh, shear stress uh, necessary for amorphization versus number of dislocations. And you see that, for example, a dislocation can reduce shear stress from 9 GPA to 1.5. And of course, we can uh, apply more dislocations. But uh, also important point is that, again, not everything is uh, good. That when we study screw dislocations, all of them pass through all, uh, they pass through all three grain boundaries. So actually, they cannot pile up. They cannot promote phase transformations. OK, one of, now it's microscale. One of the uh, drawback of uh, phase field, nanoscale phase field approach is that it resolves actual phase interfaces. And this is like one nanometer, and we need uh, uh, four, five uh, finite elements uh, to resolve this, to obtain mesh independent solution. That means, by definition, we cannot uh, treat large samples. That is why we develop completely different uh, microscale, scale-free phase field approach. Um, and uh, we combine this with plasticity, but we cannot combine this with traditional crystal plasticity because we still want to have our stress concentrator and dislocation pileup. And we introduce dislocation pileup through uh, formulation of contact problem of continuum mechanics. So we cut it here. In many places, we introduce possibility to slip of one side with respect to another, like in contact of two bodies. And uh, this reproduces uh, continuous distribution of dislocation along uh, slip planes. And uh, it reproduces all required stress concentrator. And also, we were surprised, it reproduces our nanoscale results. But here we uh, can study much larger samples. So this is polycrystalline sample on the shear. And this is red is distribution of um, Red is uh, high pressure phase, and here uh, red is uh, actually its volume fraction of different uh, crystallographically equivalent variants. And uh, you see here uh, kinetics uh, phase uh, volume fraction of uh, uh, high pressure phase versus shear in different grains, very heterogeneous, and in some grains you see there is direct phase transition and then partial reverse phase transition. We also determine parameter average over the entire sample. It's uh, how pressure varies with shear strain, shear stresses, volume fraction of high pressure phase, each martensitic variance. And also, we found very interesting results that, uh, you see, this is simplest expression for phase, for phase equilibrium. Now we are not talking about nucleation, we are talking about stationary microstructure. So this is work of stresses on transformation strain, and it's equal to jump in thermal energy. Uh, under hydrostatic conditions, this is just work of high of pressure 
on volumetric strain. In this condition, you see there is nothing from plastic strain here. There is no surface energy. But if you come back, this condition corresponds to white lines. And you see these white lines. And practically almost all interfaces coincide with these white lines. It means that such simple phase equilibrium condition is satisfied at, um, at each equilibrium interface. And uh, also, if you average the same condition over the entire sample, it's also satisfied. And this is very important information and quite unexpected result. And uh, all this kinetic equation and this information uh, is currently used by us to develop um, advanced uh, microscale kinetics for plastic strain induced phase transformation. But currently, we are still using our old equation, which, is, uh, which also takes into account what, all what we learned at nanoscale in our analytical model. And for example, um, nucleation is barrierless. So there is no need to wait for thermal fluctuation. That is time is not parameter. And plastic strain plays a role of time-like parameter. So kinetic equation is derivative of volume fraction of high pressure phase with respect to accumulated plastic strain. Also, dislocations, dislocation pile up generate both compressive and tensile stresses of the same magnitude, but in different regions. That is why they promote both direct and reverse phase transition in different regions. That is why we have two terms for direct phase transition and for reverse phase transition. Also, when we get at least two phase mixture, plastic strain is very heterogeneous. So it localizes in uh, weaker phase. And we develop a very simple model which determines um, plastic strain in each phase versus uh, average plastic strain and ratio of yield strengths of phases. That is why this equation includes actually the ratio of yield strengths of phases. And this equation, despite its simplicity, it allows, uh, it allows uh, to explain a lot of non-trivial and quite contradictory experimental results. But I would like to show our first uh, quantitative confirmation. And actually, uh, it's, uh, it took almost 15 years to get to this. Why? Because uh, uh, we cannot measure plastic strain distribution. That is why we could not use this equation directly. I mean, uh, to calibrate, to check, but we use it in modeling. Um, well, now what we do, we are using um, assumption that uh, we have the same kinetic equation for any type of straining. Is it uh, plastic compression or any combination of pressure and shear? Kinetic equation is the same. This is very strong assumption. But if you assume this, then we can focus at the center of sample when there are no shears due to symmetry. And then accumulated plastic strain is just logarithm of ratio of initial to final sequence. So we can know now plastic strain. And uh, we study a phase transition from uh, alpha to omega um, phases, phase uh, in zirconium. So this kinetic equation uh, contains, um, this is uh, phase transition pressure under hydrostatic conditions. It's determined from separate experiment. And this is phase uh, minimum pressure for plastic strain induced phase transition. It's, uh, by the way, we did not obtain reverse strain induced phase transition. That is why we have only one term. So minimum pressure for the uh, plastic strain induced phase transition was found to be 1.2 GPA. This is 4.0 times smaller than under hydrostatic condition and almost three times smaller than uh, phase equilibrium pressure. Now you see here, this is pressure, this is plastic strain. And for three samples, uh, there are three different uh, loading, uh, loading paths. This is for poor compression, and this is for compression and shear. We can get phase transition under, my, under much lower pressure, as you see. And when you collapse all this experimental data uh, in terms of uh, this parameter, which follows from our kinetic equation, you see that uh, they all 
along the same line, and this solid line corresponds to our kinetic equation. So indeed, this is confirmation of this kinetic equation. And also we found unknown parameters, unknown parameters um, like K, W, uh, yield stress was found independently, and uh, up, um, confirmed this kinetic equation. And by the way, one of important points to get such simple kinetic equation was uh, confirmation of such equation and simplify is drastically entire problem, is to preliminary deform material up to very high strain. Uh, at low pressure without any phase transition, but uh, uh, up to such strain that uh, hardness and yield strengths do don't increase anymore. And then we obtain stationary microstructure. So this drastically simplifies. Then yield strengths are not function of plastic strain, and we can indeed obtain such simple equation. Now, what is also important, what we found, we use different magnitude of preliminary plastic deformation before phase transition, but results are independent of this. This is also very important. It should be uh, higher than critical value to reach uh, this saturation of hardening state, but then uh, behavior is independent of preliminary plastic deformation. Um, and uh, also about minimum pressure for strain-induced phase transitions, this 1.2. You see here pressure distribution in uh, low and high pressure phases, and um, these yellow squares correspond to initiation, so first detection of omega phase. And at, at, uh, already, uh, it corresponds to the same pressure, 1.2 GPA. So you see, uh, here we have just compression without shears. Here we have, uh, we have very complex combination of uh, compression and shear, but the uh, result is independent of, uh, um, of uh, strain state. And this is very important. First, it confirms our hypothesis that we indeed can use our equation for any straining path. And practical value is that uh, based on this, strain-induced phase transition under compression in diamond anvil cell and shear in rotational di diamond cell don't differ in terms of kinetics, physical mechanism, and modeling because we obtain the same results. And in contrast to traditional wisdom, it's not plastic shear, but any plastic straining produce uh, the same uh, reduction in transition pressure in comparison with hydrostatic condition. And generally, it would be wrong to say that shear reduces phase transition pressure in comparison with compression. Uh, so this is, I believe, quite important uh, conclusion. Okay, and this kinetic equation is here. And it's part of our macro scale model, which I will not discuss. I will just mention that yield strength depends on pressure, um, plastic strain, and volume fraction of phases. And we use Murnagan um, nonlinear elasticity rule. We solve uh, maybe hundreds problem, and uh, I will show only few results. So you see here experiment uh, for Fullerian. This is uh, before phase transition to fuller and four and uh, rotation. And this is stress distribution after rotation and phase transition. Force is fixed. Uh, volume reduces by 35%. So everyone would expect a uh, reduction in uh, pressure. But you see pressure grows. And um, this, uh, well, this looks like a contradiction to Le Chatelier principle, but uh, as I told, uh, classical thermodynamics does not work for plastic strain induced phase transition. And with our model, without uh, any tricks, we reproduced, um, you see, during rotation, volume fraction of high pressure phase increases in central region and pressure increases. And uh, how, why? Because uh, during compression at fixed force, this is quarter of sample. You see sickness reduces, and this compensates volume reduction due, uh, due to phase transition. 
And also high pressure phase here is much stronger than low pressure phase. Then friction is higher also. And even if you use simplified equilibrium equation, pressure gradient is proportional to friction stress, then we will, uh, then the pressure gradient should grow during phase transition. And that is what is observed. And there are various other exper uh, experimental results which are explained by this model. And uh, now I would like to consider solution for just compression, uh, hexagonal boronitrite which transforms to versitic boronitrite within rhenium gasket. And uh, we use our um, model for plastic strain induced phase transition. And um, we use such uh, minimum pressure for direct phase transition, which come for strain induced phase transition, which come from experiment. And what does it mean? That if you will apply 6.8 GPA and uh, large plastic deformation, we can not only start but complete this phase transition. Okay, but uh, when we compress, despite the fact that we have the same equation, plastic strain uh, appears uh, during pressure increase. We don't need this, we don't want this, but it increases. And actually pressure grows here faster than plastic strain, if you can compare. And as a result of solution, we obtain that uh, phase transition is not detectable below 12 GPA. And even at 53 GPA, there are regions with small plastic strain where phase transition did not even start. So what the experimentalist would report? Exactly like this, phase transition start pressure is 12 and uh, it does not uh, complete even at 53 GPA. But it has nothing to do with material behavior because we know that uh, entire phase transition can be completed at 6.8 GPA if you will, uh, will not increase pressure during our loading process. And if we change uh, size, sample, thickness, uh, mat gasket material, these numbers will be changed. So actually in such experiment, in 90% uh, of experiments, uh, what we report is uh, system behavior, not material behavior. And practically what I showed you for zirconium, this is first uh, characterization of material behavior because it was done based on local parameters and uh, it's uh, independent of surrounding and based of uh, on theory and calibration of this theory and verification of theory. And uh, actually uh, what is the uh, advantage of rotational diamond cell despite the fact that physics is the same that we can control loading paths and uh, after some optimization for the same problem, I mean geometry, gasket, uh, uh, we obtain such a result that you see during quite significant shear and during phase transformation, um, pressure does not grow. So we can keep pressure constant and run phase transition by increasing plastic deformation. This is simulation and actually we had the, we, uh, showed this before using simple analytical model, and then it was confirmed in experiment. So this is boronitride, and this is pressure distribution. You see quasi-homogeneous pressure distribution after compression and shear. Next compression and shear. Next compression and shear and complete phase transition. So this is controllable, and that is uh, advantage of um, advantage of rotational diamond tendal cell. I promise to show you importance of plastic straining uh, for pressure induced phase transition and even more at zero pressure. So this is just temperature induced phase transition. You can apply pressure if you wish. This is phase transition in steel, very small volumetric strain, just 0.2%, but uh, quite typical shear strain of 0.2%. Here we have large, we have, I show part of large sample of low uh, austenite and uh, this martensitic plate nucleus. You see this uh, shear by 20%, it's visible. But uh, after such shear, plastic deformation and surrounding already reach 46%. 
And in Martensite, in Nostonite, in Martensite, just maximum 8% because Martensite is uh, three times stronger. But then interface moves and inherits plastic deformation. And you see now plastic strain reaches 60%, both in Nostonite and Martensite, and you see how strong deformation it practically restores this 20% shear, but uh, local deformation is 50-60%. Uh, and this plastic deformation drastically affects stress field here and arrest phase transition. So this shows that uh, even under hydrostatic condition, or even, if, even without any stresses, uh, still plastic strain occurs and um, it strongly affects phase transformation. Now, um, so we want to determine distribution of all, we need to determine the distribution of all components of stress tensor, plastic strain tensor in, uh, um, yes, in entire volume in order to characterize phase transformation. And uh, this cannot be done uh, po experimentally or theoretically. That is why we develop a combined procedure. And this is example, tungsten up to 400 GPA, just plastic deformation. And we use experimental data from this paper. And you see four pressure distributions, experimental, and four distributions of sample profile. Then we used our macro scale model uh, and to model these two situations and calibrate it by fitting to this curve. And that's it. And then we made predictions for higher pressure and you see quite good correspondence between uh, theory and experiment. And also for all four profiles of sample, we have very good correspondence. And we did not use any geometric parameter from here to calibrate our model. So this is indeed very strong verification by um, six independent curves. And that is why we can claim that our model is uh, robust and reliable. And that is why all data which we obtain, for example, pressure dependence of yield strength, it's uh, much more precise than in previous publications. And uh, I believe for the first time, pressure dependence of friction coefficient was determined up to high pressure. And actually friction stress is distributed very non-trivial. You see, for example, for 300 GPA at the center, this is region of um, Coulomb friction, very small region of plastic friction, and then adhesion, no relative slide. And if uh, one, someone will use a method of measuring of um, uh, yield strength and shear based on pressure gradient, there is only very small region where this can be done. And of course, this is uh, not reliable. Nobody knows where this region without simulation. And also we uh, refined elastic constants for diamond by fitting. Uh, because it's a very complex and large uh, elastic deformation, so to the some four so the constants, and uh, no so to the elastic constants for tungsten in Mornagan potential. And now our results for we can calculate based on reliable model distribution of all components of stress tensor, elastic strain tensor, lattice rotation, and so on. Now, this is a recent work also group from Berkeley developed method to measure uh, distribution of all components of stress tensor along um, diamond coolant. Uh, but not all of them were determined equally precisely. So shear stress uh, was less precise. So our role here was that uh, we did simulation and we fitted our simulation to good distribution of uh, to distribution of good components of stresses, and uh, by this fitting we determine boundary condition not only here but also at uh, inclined surface. And then with this boundary condition we can uh, produce distribution of stresses in all in the entire angle. And uh, last result. Uh, 
uh, shear driven phase transition from graphite uh, to diamond. I will talk only about cubic diamond. So under hydrostatic conditions, uh, graphite uh, phase equilibrium pressure for graphite diamond is 2.45 GPU. Lattice instability in ideal graphite is uh, 250 GPU. And an experiment uh, with uh, real defective graphite, uh, diamond is claimed to be found at 70 GPU. But uh, with our phase field approach, we showed that this phase transition potentially could be driven just by shear and zero pressure. And then motivated by this prediction, low pressure experiments was performed. And indeed, diamond was obtained at 0.7 GPA and moderate plastic shear. So this is 100 times smaller than under hydrostatic condition. And it was uh, quenchable. So it's um, irreversible phase transition. And uh, this is at the moment uh, absolute record in reduction in phase transition pressure. Uh, I believe it also requires additional mechanism. Uh, I am not sure that exactly for graphite, just our mechanism explains this, can explain this quantitatively. And uh, if this result is scalable, then it uh, can be a basis for technology of low pressure of diamond synthesis. And also it may have uh, implications in geophysics. And uh, I will show conclusions and uh, I am ready to get questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Valeri. Lots of very good material. Any questions for Valeri? Just speak up, unmute yourself, or put a question in the chat box. I have one question. Um, this is uh, Russ, this is Arjan. Um, Valerie, you showed one slide where you were talking about um, changing from uh, in steel to, to martensite. Right. Calculating, right. I was wondering whether that one, yeah, you just passed that one. Was this for pure iron or this is an iron? No, carbon? this is steel. This is steel. This is uh, uh, alloyed steel. All right. Do you remember what carbon content? Uh, no, I don't. The, there are several elements and I don't remember because it was almost 20 years oh, ago. I but see. it's in this, this, but this is in, in this paper. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Valerie and Russ, this is Savine. Hi, Savine. From UCR and PNNL. Fantastic talk as usual. Um, Okay, the, the, the last slide that you presented before the conclusion, that one got me a little bit because, you know, I'm a comic book fan and I've always seen the comic books where Superman squeezes coal in his hand and turns it into diamond. Or there's a DuckTales episode where elephants run over a field of coal and they all turn into diamonds afterwards. So, you know, this, this claim at the bottom is a really, really, really extreme claim. What this is basically saying is that even in conventional high pressure torsion, we should be able to convert diamond to, I, 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 we should be able to convert graphite to diamond phase. So um, can you can you be a little bit more specific on what the assumptions are for, for this very, very, very strong claim to be true? Well, this is, uh, okay, assumptions weigh in theory. This is experimental result. So there are no any assumptions. You compress, measure pressure, produce shear, measure pressure, and uh, then uh, you already detect in C2 diamond, actually it was also hexagonal diamond, even at 0.4 GP, but it was not quenchable. It was but not quenchable. was not quenchable. Uh, hexagonal diamond disappeared. But uh, cubic diamond was quenchable. And uh, then, uh, yes, it was also identified not only by, by X-ray, but by TM. Yeah, so under and these it, constraints, we could potentially do this even under high-pressure torsion. I think so. You know, um, it, pro it also probably strongly, not probably, 
uh, strongly depend on initial material. And I believe in this case, somehow there was luck of, uh, for initial materials. Because uh, Blanc group did uh, many experiments, but they mostly did it to much higher pressure. And this is smallest pressure that they can get uh, irreversible cubic diamond. Maybe, but maybe if we started with some of Russ's highly defective diamond materials, uh, but who knows? Well, graphite, you mean graphite, yeah? Yeah, yeah well, uh, it depends. This is a single result. Of course, it requires uh, further detailed study and confirmation, but uh, it is. Okay. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvie. As a follow-up, I'd like to um, ask you something. Is another way of really looking at this, and it relates to the diamond uh, synthesis example here, is by introducing large plastic strains, you're introducing a large number of defects, as you say. Right. So if you look at this thermodynamically, when you introduce these defects, you are uh, increasing the free energy. So in a strictly thermodynamic sense, it's the, it's the defective nature of the material, not necessarily the strain that's destabilizing it relative to the high pressure phase. Absolutely right. So the plastic strain, and I, be, I believe I told you this, plastic strain is a way to introduce strong defects. To introduce right. this, let's say, dislocation pile up with large number of defects or disclinations or uh, non-grain structure, maybe all of them contribute. Right. Yes, right. this is true. Yeah. So, so that means, in in general, then, if you want to make these high pressure phases, the challenge is introducing those defects into the starting materials, and you could further test this by simply recovering the material that's defective and doing calorimetry to look at the true energy content. And then you'd have a whole new way of making high pressure phases at lower pressure, kind of independent of the strain part of it. Uh, well, uh, not straightforward. And well, actually, I, when I summarize nanoscale result, uh, I, I call this defect induced synthesis, not strain induced synthesis. So it's completely in line what you are saying. But if you introduce defects before phase transition, it may not help. It may not help. It should be during phase transition. And why? Because let's say you introduce uh, um, dislocation pile up, right? But it can uh, stress concentrator from dislocation pile up, can relax through dislocations, right? And through twinning, through fracture maybe, and then it's not effective anymore. So you introduce a lot of defects, but they are like uh, not uh, effective stress concentrate. Mm -hmm. And then I would, um, I would not interpret this in terms of uh, energy average over something. It should be energy here, energy here. And not only energy, it should be loss of stability of parent phase or close to loss of stability. Because if you consider something in average sense, in average sense, I don't see that there will be, I already did this, right? I believe I considered this in average sense and I showed that you cannot get anything in every sense. So this is very local processes. Mm -hmm. This is like laser melting. Instead of melting entire big piece of material, you melt it point by point. Here, instead of transforming entire volume, you transform it uh, sm small region by small region. Okay. More questions? So, uh, well, this is Sun Yang. So, yeah, I'm from uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So, I have a question. So, you're using the dislocation pile up model, right, to, to, to explain the local high pressure or shear to introduce, to, to inju uh, induce the phase transition. So uh, material under high pressure or severe uh, shear deformation. 
So at a water land scale, we can use in the dislocation pile up model because, because yeah, under that deformation, maybe uh, dislocation uh, pile up maybe like uh, uh, make the material uh, amorphization. So, so really, really water land scale, we can really see uh, the material, uh, the dislocation is really the kind of individual dislocation pile up. Can you make a comment? Well, uh, dislocation pileups are visible. At, uh, it depends on grain size. But uh, uh, for example, you see here in first slide, and you can Google dislocation pileup and you will get a lot of nice pictures. So you see, this is, let me check. I believe this is half of micrometer. And uh, you see dislocation pileup. Here, it's even longer, I don't know scale here. So it can be at any scale, but um, mostly in our case, I believe this is at nanoscale. Why? Because uh, after large plastic deformation, uh, we obtain nanograin structure. So that is why this location pile up should, should be like 100 nanometers, 50 nanometers. And also there, are, but uh, also there are collective effects of this location pile up. This can be shear bands. For example, mm -hmm. uh, strain induced phase transition in trip steel occurs at intersection of shear bands. And then transformed region, this intersection has characteristic size of uh, 100 nanometers, 200 nanometers. But this is not single dislocation pile up. It's a uh, uh, shear band. It can be intersection of twins. So, and um, you know, it can be also kilometer size in ge geophysical uh, scale, right? If you have sliding, for example, here, this is scale free. Let me show this model again. This is scale free. It can be kilometer by kilometer, but this is localized shear bands. They also produce similar stress concentrator. If you have sliding of one piece with respect to another within bulk material, it produces stress field equivalent to dislocation pile up. So it's a multi-scale phenomenon. Main physics is, uh, I believe, at nanoscale, but uh, it goes up to any scale and even to macroscopic shear bands. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, uh, also about the dislocation pile up. So, uh, so do you use in the equilibrium uh, uh, profile of dislocation pile up or because maybe the dislocation really uh, pile up is not equilibrium, right? That, so they have a different uh, distribution. And if we have a different distribution of dislocation, so you will get a very different dislocation, uh, uh, stress concentration. So, so how that may affect? Well, it affects. Uh, first, yes, we consider dynamics. That means that it evolves. It starts from, for example, here it starts from uh, dislocation-free sample. Actually, we always start with dislocation-free sample. Then dislocation nucleate, number of dislocation increases, and we study this in detail. So, for example, for dislocation produce very small nucleus, then when number of dislocation increases, it grows. Then uh, if they are close, they coalesce. But uh, yes, it's a, a dynamic process. And here- So, so when you apply to the real material process, yep. so how you really consider what kind of dissolving pile up will form? Because using the crystal plasticity, we didn't have the really that dislocation like a configuration there, right? Well, bad point is that we don't see this in experiment, uh, that this model based on dislocation pile up is uh, poor theoretical prediction. So we know that there are dislocation pile up and we use them because this is the strongest concentrator I know. But uh, there is no direct uh, confirmation because it's uh, indeed very small scale and uh, it would be great if someone can find method to, to detect this. Even at low pressure, it's not, uh, uh, well, 
it's not well proved. It's uh, well known that uh, nu martensite nucleates at these locations, but there are not a lot of clean works which show this. Because when you prepare, this should be TM probably, and when you prepare a sample, this uh, large dislocation, uh, well, pileups can relax. And uh, well, I don't know experimental confirmation exactly of this mechanism. And as I said, it may be also different mechanism. And for example, in trip still, it's not dislocation pileup, it's intersection of shear bands. But based on this mechanism, we derived microscale kinetic equations. We explained many experimental results. We did predictions, which are confirmed, not directly, but indirectly and quantitatively confirmed. So it's plausible. That's all what I can say at the moment. And this is an uh, outstanding problem. And, uh, if someone can do something in this direction to find real stress, local stress concentrator near uh, strain-induced nucleus, this would be great. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, very good. We have some uh, questions in the chat. Speak up. Nikolai, do you want to ask your question? Okay, Maggie? Do you hear me? Go ahead. This is a great application of quite universal methods uh, to mostly simple materials, uh, uh, elemental solids. So my question is, uh, can the same method be applied to slightly more complicated materials like binary nickel titanium, which happen to be shape memory alloy? Uh, generally, yes. Uh, problem why, uh, uh, OK. The nickel titanium has zero volumetric transformation strain. That is why it's almost pointless to study it under hydrostatic pressure. But yes, the same method was applied. Actually, for steel, it's uh, more than binary. I don't remember exactly, but it has uh, four or five elements. So there are no limitations. Uh, but uh, additional point, if you have alloying elements, plastic deformation can cause additional effect. It can uh, lead to oversaturated, um, oversaturation in some regions or in entire regions. So you have additional degree of freedom and this is uh, completely, let's say, independent. No, it's dependent, but it's, uh, it has additional degrees of freedom and it will be new science. The same for chemical reactions. There are experiments, this method is used uh, for chemical reaction, for various reaction, decomposition, and uh, uh, reaction in polymers, uh, polymerization reaction. So I believe that uh, it's a quite universal method, but uh, in each specific case, uh, result may be very specific. In addition to some general, let's say first order, theory. There are various uh, very specific details. But uh, general answer, yes, it can be applied to multi-component system. Okay. Well, steel is simpler in a sense than shape memory alloys. In shape memory alloys, there is super elasticity where large deformations uh, can be, can happen without significant stress. Right. And well, uh, shape memory alloys do have a super elasticity. Right. It has, but that is not what uh, we are interested in. Okay, let's put in a such way. All what you want to say about uh, shape memory alloys, this is stress-induced phase transition. This is stress-induced, uh, not plastic strain-induced. If you will uh, start plastic strain-induced phase transition in shape memory alloys, you will spoil effect. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, this um, pseudo elasticity will be destroyed. And actually uh, there, are, there are many papers uh, uh, when um, preliminary plastic deformation is used to increase hysteresis and uh, to, for example, for energy absorption purposes. Yeah, so if you want to talk about shape memory alloys, uh, real applications, 
this is not uh, not good method because it actually spoils uh, some of effects. It increases hysteresis, it increases uh, energy absorption for shape memory errors. But you don't need high pressure. You can do any plastic deformation, uh, traditional method, it, it will work. And that is what is done in applications for shape memory errors. It's called house forming, mar forming. This is plastic deformation of austenite or plastic deformation of martensite. And this also controls martensitic transformation, stress and temperature. Okay, Thank you. a few more questions if you're interested in staying on. Hi, can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, yes. So this is uh, this question is regarding the, uh, uh, this is Mageshwari from uh, PNNL. So this question is regarding uh, the minimum pressure for uh, direct strain induced transformation. Uh, the pressure reduces as a function of uh, plastic strain. So I'm interested yeah. in understanding the effect of temperature. So maybe after a certain temperature, the recovery process might um, might not uh, like lead to uh, uh, reduction in pressure for strain induced uh, phase transformations, but below the temperature, what do you think the effect of temperature would be? Like, does it aid um, in even increasing the pressure further, or does it increase the uh, minimum pressure for uh, phase transformations? Okay, uh, general answer. General answer. Uh, if you are above recrystallization temperature, then the effect cannot accumulate. You cannot produce dislocation pile up or any strong stress concentrator. They will, uh, material will recrystallize and annihilate them. So limit case, if you are above yes. recrystallization temperature, this method will not work. At lower temperature, it yes. depends on many parameters. So it depends whether Temperature itself promotes phase transition or suppresses phase transition, but the uh, bad point is that uh, temperature usually reduces yield strength, and uh, that means that uh, non-hydrostatic stresses will be will be uh, well limited by lower yield strength, and also it may activate different mechanisms of stress relaxation like diffusion, and then instead of, weight, instead of getting our phase transformation, creep may uh, reduce stress concentrator due to dislocation pile up. So that is why we don't, did not study effect of temperature, but uh, quanti um, group um, uh, Vladimir Blanc from uh, Troitsk, they studied, they studied uh, well, at least I remember some experiments at uh, slightly elevated temperature and uh, at cryogenic temperature. I don't remember honestly comparison how uh, this effect works for different temperatures. I, I don't remember. But uh, generally, increase in temperature should uh, reduce this effect and finally eliminate above recrystallization temperature and the reduction in temperature should promote this effect. Okay, uh, what is the last name of the uh, uh, person that you just mentioned, Vladimir? Okay, it's, uh, I believe that the uh, recording will be available and his name is in last Okay, yeah, I can check it. Blanc at you. Okay, thank you. So why don't we take one more question? Hey, hi, Valerie. This is Arun Devraj from PNNL. Uh, great talk hi, as usual. <laughs> so, uh, one question uh, on the like continuation on the temperature aspect of it. So, what about the deformation-induced heating? Um, I'm, I'm, I know that your strain rate is not too high that you are generating a lot of heat in most of your experiments, but uh, and the diamonds can actually quench the heat rather quickly. So can you comment anything on, um, in, in, you know, our cases where we are rotating very fast and uh, uh, with diamonds, uh, any, any comments on uh, how that heat extraction will happen and what role it might play into the, all of these observations? Okay, uh, in our case completely, because uh, of reason you said, but uh, 
uh, as I remember when we discussed this with you, you told me that uh, uh, actually even at uh, high strain rate, so it was like, I don't remember, 100 rotation per second or 1,000 rotation per second. Also, yeah. you said the temperature increases just by uh, a yeah. few degrees, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't have any additional information and uh, I believe your information is the first one in this field, the fact of okay. And this is really great because, uh, you know, people struggle when they study viscoplastic behavior of material, how mm -hmm. to separate effect of temperature and strain rate. Yeah. Because here there is no temperature increase. Uh, it's possible to find strain rate dependence and strain dependence uh, uh, at any prescribed temperature. This yeah. opportunity. It's not uh, easy, it's a very difficult to yeah. track this information at high yeah. strain rate. But uh, probably, it's do probably it's doable. Maybe you okay. can. <laughs> great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the great talk and thank you for organizing. Thank you for the question. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Valeri for an excellent talk, lots of good discussion. We'll be posting this recording. If any of you are not on the mailing list, just send me an email and I'll put you on the regular mailing list for this uh, weekly seminar series. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much, Ulf. And Russ, again, thank you for arranging and for inviting. Bye. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.